Welcome to At the Crossroads Church weekly podcast. Our hope is that you will grow in your walk with God and be blessed and encouraged in your daily lives as you listen. You can visit us at our website at atthecrossroads.ca. So Pastor Rick and Kathy are going to come and minister the word. Let's give them a hand as they come. Well, could everybody stand? First of all, I would like to say thank you to Pastor Travis and Camilla for hosting us today. Let's give God thanks for your pastors. We don't say that lightly. You know, the Bible speaks about honoring those, your spiritual leaders, which are over you in the Lord. There's a principle that we have learned about honor that is huge to God, but it's also huge to the body of Christ here. And there's something when they honor the gift, I believe it releases the anointing that's inside of you so that you can be everything and all that God wants you to be. So we don't take lightly the work that the two of you have done to bring us in this weekend. We know that it just didn't happen, okay? So I just want to honor you and say thank you, Pastor Travis and Pastor Camilla. You guys are all, and you're fun to be with. You're actually good. I, I, I like laughing with people and just being who we really are. Amen. I want to also say thanks to Pastor Mike over here and Linda. Uh, without Mike in the organization, um, he brings something to Open Bible. I, I believe it's a spirit of faith. Amen. They both love the Word of God, and they both have been such an encouragement to me over the years, especially, especially in the area of faith. How many have ever been weary in your faith? The Bible says, be not weary in well-doing for in due season you will reap how many know we need people in our lives surround us when we're weary it's not sin to be weary okay we need people that are going to be strong in the area of faith and mike you've done that and exemplified that to me and i just want to say thank you let's give thanks for mike and linda amen and then without the regional, Mark over here and his lovely wife, Wendy, uh, we appreciate you, Mark. I know it's been a tough season for yourself personally with some of the family things that are going on. But you know what? You're the real deal, and we just appreciate you and love you. And we need to give thanks for the regional, Mark over here. One more time. Come on, guys. Okay. And last of all, but not least, I want to thank God for the gift of God that he's given me in Kathy. I'm the man that I am today because of Kathy. I don't say that lightly. I don't just say words up here, and she knows that I'm not a flatter, but I know that I wouldn't be where I'm at and doing what we're doing without Kathy in my life. So we need to give God thanks for this one here. Amen? And we're ready to start. You can be seated. How many know in life, um, as I introduce this here, how many know that all of us need people in our lives, our inner circles of life, to unburden our hearts at times? to speak things through, to help you walk through, to bring you into a different perspective of seeing things sometimes that you might not be able to see. And they say that it gets lonely at the top, okay? Well, I don't believe that needs to be a true statement that it gets lonely. I believe that there's others that are there that can be with us right there. Come on. And really, uh, when we speak about lonely at the top, oftentimes we talk of apostolic ministry, and really apostolic ministry gets right into the face of people. It gets right into the relational aspect of people. I'm, t- I'm just going to state it right now. I'm totally opposed to this whole movement where we're up here as apostles and the people are way down here. I think the Bible speaks about that, called us the doctrine of the Nicolaitans that God actually says that I hate. Come on, church. And really, if you look at it, Paul mentions in in, in his epistles all the relationships that he had. How many have ever studied uh, Greek mythology? Nobody's ever studied. So you've never read read the book of Romans chapter 16. Okay, our, our First Corinthians, it, it, it's, it's a Greek mythology lesson in First Corinthians 16 because it speaks about all the relationships that Paul had with all the people, and, and, and he spoke something personally about every one of them, and it's in the Word of God for you and I as an example. Come on now, because everybody needs encouragement and everybody needs affirmation. Kathy and I, we have, uh, we're excited, and two weeks are going to be down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and prior to that, we got a, she's going to be up with, I think, uh, Linda in Sudbury, or no, in Ottawa. I'll be up in Sudbury. We'll both be in Abbotsford before all that, okay? So we're going to be over there to celebrate our pastor, Pastor Larry Stockstill from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He's having his 50th year of ministry celebration. Hang on, without a scandal. 
Amen. How many can say that's a really, really good thing today to go 50 years in that? Now, seeing the church turned over to his son, Kathy and I went down there to the uh, transitional service, just like Mike and Linda came up to our transitional service. We gave it to our son, RJ. And I'll never forget, I, I, when I went down there, it was like, Larry, uh, in my heart, I'm saying, Larry, I think you might be missing it on this here. This kid you're putting in charge here is 30 years old. He's not a preacher. He's a worship leader. His name was Jonathan Stockstill, okay? And, I, and, and so in my heart, I'm saying, okay, so we're here to support you. We're here to pray for you. We're here to believe. And then the kid gets up. He's 30 years old. He gets up and preaches. And, man, I had to take back every thought that I had. Come on. <laughs> And, and, and he preached the message, and I got it in my phone, because that's where I put my notes, and, and it was titled, I Got It. And all he did in the entire message, his first message was acknowledge his grandfather, Roy, on his mother's side, his, fa his grandfather on his dad's side, which was uh, uh, Larry's dad, Dr., what, whatever his name was, okay, Roy Stockstill, and then he acknowledged his dad, then he acknowledged his brother, Joel for his influence on his life, and then he acknowledged his mother. And man, by the time we got done in there, so I said, "This kid's got it." Okay, so not only did he say he had it, but he had it. Amen. I'm saying all that. We're going down there to celebrate their anniversary. And one thing it is, it's it's one thing to say that you have a pastor. It's another thing that when your pastor speaks into your life and says things, do you really receive what it is that he has to say? And I had some correction that came to me actually in the whole transitional thing that Kathy and I, we just had some challenges because we were seeing things uh, both from a different perspective in the whole thing. And uh, we needed some counsel. So we called our pastor and he set some time up for us. And so when we were down there, we had a couple hours with him and he just really set it straight. And he did it in a kind way, did it in a gentle way, but it was, it was probably the best thing that I needed to hear. Come on now. I'm stating all that because we all need to have people in our lives. None of us are out there islands to ourselves. We all need them. Now, here's where we're going to go today. At one of his conferences, he introduced a man that I had never heard of before. And this man was uh, just a new pastor. He started a church in uh, Alabama in 2001. And at this time, this was probably six years old. And he had taken the church, a new church, from about 100 and some people. And he had taken it at that time to 11,000 people. Okay. The man today has taken that church from 11,000 from then till today. He's got 22 campuses now that he has planted churches in and totaled up. They're doing over, they're ministering over 55,000 people every weekend. That is not speaking, listen, of Easter numbers over there. That's speaking of how many people that this one man in the last 17, 18 years has been able to connect to the master plan that God has for their life. Amen? So here's Kathy and I from Canada, and we're there in the conference, and we have the opportunity to meet a lot of the speakers afterwards in the green room. And this guy gets up there and speaks, and man, I mean, just he started talking. You just knew that he had something. How many, how many know what I'm talking about? You know, you can say a lot of words, but those words can mean nothing at the end of the day. But when this guy got done, what he said, I had everything in my phone. I said, Kath, I really believe this is actually a rhema word from God, and this is for us and for WCF. Come on. But I recognize it wasn't Pastor Travis just for WCF. It's for all of us as pastors in the body of Christ. And he shared this, and I believe we touched on this in the past. We're going to go into a little more detail on this here. He shared six words. In those six words, if you're taking notes, it probably would be wise to write these six words down because every one of us in this room has a part to play in what we're going to be sharing right now. It's not just for the five-fold ministry gifts, the local church. How many know that the pastors cannot do their job without the teachers in the church? The pastors can't do their job without the evangelist in the church. The pastors can't do their job individually. They need the helps ministry in the church. They need the supportive roles. They need the children's leaders. We need all these areas of ministry to successfully pull off the churches out here. And the six words, and I'm going to give you them very quickly, and then Kathy's going to go right into the first one. We want to come on here. We'll probably spend uh, almost a third to half of the message just on this first point because to me it's probably the key to everything. Everybody look and say genuine authentic. 
So when we speak of genuine and authentic, we speak of the real deal. The second one, if you're taking notes, uh, is relevant. Say relevance. And then thirdly, just write the word excellent. Excellence. Excellence. And then fourthly, you can put there enjoyable. How many know there's some people that it's great to be around, and there's other people you don't want to be around? Okay. Okay. They're fun-loving. They're enjoyable. Okay. And then number five over there that, that he came up with was they're accepting. Accepting. They love people. Accepting people group. Because they might have uh, spiked here. I remember I was doing a series on value judging. And what I did was I came home one day and Kathy was, uh, gave me that look. How many guys have ever had that look? Nobody in here has ever had that look. Are you afraid to raise your hand right now? Okay. Okay. I, I remember I shaved my head, the sides of my head, and we did a mohawk. And this guy is now my, he's now my associate youth pastor. Amen. Mike. And so he was a hairstylist back then, pretty crazy in the world. And then he ended up getting saved, led him to Christ, and now he's working for me. So anyway, I shaved my head. I did a mohawk. And then I highlighted it. He highlighted it with blonde highlights. Okay. And then, and so I came home, and man, I got the look of love, <laughs> okay? My wife says, are you in the change of life? And I says, I don't know what I'm in, but I'm enjoying it. Don't you like my dude? She says, you, you better get through it real quick, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so anyway, so anyway, that's on accepting, and I'll be sharing more on that in a few moments. And then the last one is powerful. Now, those six words that I just gave you, literally, if you look at through the Gospels and you read them, and even through the epistles, you will see that those six words are describing the person of Jesus Christ and his ministry to people. And in those six areas, it touches in to everything in the society today, 2,000 years later, because it's just as relevant, just as powerful, just as true, just as accurate today as it was 2,000 years ago. So this is where Kathy and I are going to really zero in today, because I believe this is the, the message, if you want to term it, that will take a church from 150 to 500 people. It's a message that will take a church from 500 to 1,000 and from 1,000 to 2,500. It's just how this whole thing works. And if we'll embrace it, then God can do it. Amen? Amen. 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 Go ahead, Kat. Um, Jesus. How many want to be like Jesus? You know, we all say that. We say that we want to be like Jesus. But sometimes when it comes right down to it, you know, when, when God begins to speak to us and tells us to do certain things, we don't want to do those things. And they are the things that Jesus would do. And, okay, he's taking that. So I want to read from Luke 15, verse 1 to 2, first of all. It says, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. Now, who would come to listen to Jesus teach? Tax collectors who were, they were like the scum of the earth at the time. And notorious sinners. What's a notorious sinner? Somebody well-known because they sin. <laughs> you know, they're well-known for their sin. So it. those people would come to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So in other words, they, the religious people, the self-righteous people, began to judge Jesus because he was hanging out with sinners. Now, why would Jesus hang out with sinners? You know, you got to think about that. Why would he hang out with sinners? See, he knew that they knew that there was something in them that knew they needed help. They needed help. You know, people that are self-righteous or have it all, that think they have it all together, they don't think they need any help. And they often, you know, act that way. They look down on other people. They judge other people. They, they just have attitudes. And that can happen so easily in the church. You know, we're people because we walk with God and we, you know, begin to change our lifestyle and do the things that God wants us to do. We can easily begin to judge those people out there that are still steeped in sin. But Jesus didn't do that. He didn't do that. He hung out with them. Not in a way that, you know, where he partied with them or did the things that they did. He obviously knew and, and had, he knew who he was, and, but he knew that he had something they needed. And he knew what to say to them. And that's what God is looking for in us, that we need to be authentic people, not self-righteous people. You know, I'm going to read the scripture in Luke 15, and it says, By this time, a lot of men and women of doubtful reputation. What does that mean? Doubtful, character. yeah, questionable character, right? 
were hanging around Jesus, listening intently. So obviously there was something about Jesus that drew them to him. They wanted to hear what he had to say. They were listening to every word that came out of his mouth. The Pharisees and the religious scholars were not pleased at all. They growled. (laughs) That sounds funny, they growled. (laughs) He takes in sinners and eats meals with them, treating them like old friends. And that's from the Message Bible. So, you know, Jesus was looking for people that he knew he could speak into their lives. People that he knew would, you know, he knew that they would listen to him or they would be open to him. And we, we know, and I just heard a statistic the other day, that the way the world is going, the way North America anyway is going, that in the next, you know, five or ten years, 10% of people will attempt or take their lives, mm-hmm. commit suicide. Candidates higher. Yeah. At least that number of people. That's one out of every 10 people. And why is that happening? Obviously, because of the way the world's going, which is sin. You know, all the changes, all the things that are happening in in this world. are. See, people don't see or understand that sin creates death. Sin creates hopelessness. Sin brings rejection, brings failure, brings, you know, all these things that really devastate our lives. And so the world is full of people that are doing things, making decisions that are ruining their lives. And they don't know how to get out. They don't know how to change. And so when we judge people and look down on people because they're sinners, we will never reach them. We will never reach them because we put a wall between us and them. We are called to love sinners, hate the sin, but love the sinner. And we expect sinners, and I'm, when I say we, I'm talking about the church in general, that a lot of times over the history of the church, they come across very self-righteous, and they judge people or they attack issues, which I believe we need to fight for, for righteousness for our nation, but they begin to get into almost like a physical attack with people because of the sin that they may be steeped in, and, and in doing that, they lose the opportunity to win those people. Because the only reason people don't sin is if they know Jesus. Because if we didn't know Jesus, we'd all be sinning. How many know you'd be doing some things differently in your life if you weren't a believer, right? We'd be here on a Sunday and, night. And, um, and yeah, exactly. You wouldn't be in church on Sunday night. And, and so these are the things we have to realize. So Jesus, he, he didn't look at their sin at all. He didn't focus on their sin. He focused on the heart of that person. That focused on the fact that I love this person. I care about this person. I care about what happens to them. And in order for them to get free, I have to have some kind of a relationship with them. And you can't have a relationship with somebody if you don't ever spend any time with them. And sometimes we're so afraid of, if I hang out with this person, their sin's going to get on me. Well, that's why he sent them out in twos. For one reason, he did. He, you know, he sent the disciples out in twos. You don't go, you know, places you shouldn't go alone. You go with support. You go with prayer, and you don't go if you're weak. You go, you know, if you know you're, you're if you're not tempted in area, obviously you're okay. But we we need to use wisdom. But at the same time, we need to go. We need to go. We need to do. We need to reach out to the lost and not separate ourselves to the point where we have no relationship whatsoever with people because we're too self-righteous and we're afraid their sin is going to get on us. What kind of faith people are we have if we don't think our righteousness is stronger than their sin? You know, we need to believe God and trust God. And again, use wisdom in all of this. You know, don't, you know, don't do crazy things that you could easily fall into sin. But Jesus, you know, he wasn't afraid because he knew who he was. He knew who he was. And so he was able to go with that confidence and that boldness. And so Jesus was authentic. People, that, people in the world saw something in him. But you know what they saw in him? They didn't see judgment. They saw love. They saw somebody that genuinely cared about them. And that was why they listened to him. You know, we went down to the Billy Graham uh, library, I think it was a year or two ago. It'll be two years this September, I think, we went. And, um, you know, Billy Graham's known as the best evangelist that ever existed. And besides Jesus, of course, and probably the Apostle Paul and the disciples. But um, in our day, he was the most uh, renowned evangelist, respected. And he, he was that way. He loved people. He didn't judge people, but he taught the truth. He taught, and people would come to listen to him because they knew he was real. 
and that he lived the, the life. All the presidents of the United States wanted Billy Graham to talk to them. Not all of them were saved, but they trusted him. And, and they wanted to, him to speak into their lives. And so, you know, when, when, we see that, when we see that people can come to us and know us and like us because we're not judging them. We just came, we just came off a two-week cruise. And, um, you know, when you're on a cruise ship, you know, you meet lots of different people. And, um, and they're not all saved, obviously. <laughs> but we started hanging out with this couple who were living together. And, uh, you know, but they, they really liked us because we didn't judge them when they said they were, we didn't say, you're living together, you guys should be getting married, you know, like we, we didn't react at all, you know, but we just shared our testimonies. But when we were down at the Billy Graham Library, they, they taught evangelism in a way that was just simple. It's so simple. It's a, you know, when you meet people, you just say, tell me your story. What's your story? Just ask people, like... Ask them questions. Just let them tell you. And don't judge them. Don't, you know, have expressions or, or you know, act in a way when they're telling you their story. Like, oh, you did that. You know, like, you know what I mean? Like, we just, just let them talk and just show love, show interest in them. And then when they finish telling you their story, tell them your story. But when you tell your story, you're going to tell his story because his story is a part of your story, right? And it's very simple. It's not complicated. We were able to share the gospel with this couple. Now, did they get saved? Not that we're aware of. But you know what? It didn't matter. We did what we're called to do. And, we, you know, you tell people the way, and that's what you're called to do. But Jesus, he was real. He was authentic. He cared about people. People were drawn to him. In fact, the people that hated Jesus were the self-righteous ones. They were the ones that wanted to take him out. But people that knew they were sinners, knew they needed help, they... They love Jesus, and they were drawn to him. How are people drawn to us? we got to ask ourselves that. And the needs are everywhere. I don't know if I told this story. It's hard when you travel a lot, and you're in a lot of different places. You forget what you said where. I don't even, we might have even shared this message here before. I don't know if we did. We didn't? Okay. Um, but I'm starting to keep a, 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 a calendar now where I am and what we spoke on so we can remember because it's hard. But um, I remember uh, there was a lady years ago that... Um, taught me a lot about soul winning. Her name was Myrtle, and she's passed away now. She was an older widow at the time. But she, every day, she would say, God, show me somebody I can witness to. Show, show me somebody that I can show love, your love to. And, and she didn't have much money. She just was a widow on her own. But she was so full of the joy of the Lord. And, and back uh, around the, the time when I knew her, there was a serial killer that had hap, uh, was in Mississauga. I don't know if you heard about, about that uh, did I tell you this story? I did. Okay, well, anyway, I'll tell it again for those that didn't hear it. But uh, she was watching TV because the serial killer, the trial was on, on the news every day. And she one day saw the wife of the killer in the courtroom. And she just saw the devastation on her face to find out her husband was a serial killer. And so she decided, I'm going down to the court tomorrow. And I'm going to take that woman out for lunch. And she did. And she led her to the Lord and brought her to church. And she had two young boys. And then our pastor back then, this is before I was in ministry, our pastor back then went to visit her husband in prison and led him to the Lord. But see, the opportunities are in the newspaper. They're, you know, the, the stories you hear about people whose maybe their marriage just broke up or somebody died or, you know, some devastation happened in their lives. Those are the people you go to. But don't go to preach. Go to be a friend. Go to show love and support, and then trust Jesus that he'll help you get the message across to them. But they will, they will hear the message that you act out before the message you preach. They will hear the message you act out before the message you preach. Now, you have a city here, uh, Trenton, and there's people in the city, there's people right now contemplating suicide in the city. There's people that are going to be crying themselves to sleep tonight. There's people that have been deeply rejected and wounded. They're all everywhere, and they're all around you. And you have the Spirit of God in you, and he can lead you to those people. And so being real is meaning that we're, we're acting and being like who we are, which is made in the image of God, being like Jesus and loving people instead of judging people. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save the world. I came to save the world. 
And so we're called to show people the love of God. And then in doing that, let the Holy Spirit convict them of their sin. Let him clean up their lives. Because when they find the Lord, that's what will happen. You can't do it without him. And the only way they're going to see Jesus is through how we show him to them. We demonstrate him to them. You know, I had a friend, his name was Dr. Varma. And Dr. Varma was a, a Hindu, a Hindu, very strong, but started being drawn to Christianity. And over a period of time, he ended up giving his heart to the Lord. Well, right after he gave his heart to the Lord, his daughter was a young woman over at the Metropolitan Hospital in Windsor. And she's 34 years of age, and she dies uh, on the job. She, just, she has, a, like, a heart attack, really weird, and she ended up dying. And so the doctor actually invites me to come over to, if, if I would come and just say a couple words at the funeral. And so we're sitting in the front row, and there's a Hindu priest on the left and another Hindu one on the right. And I'm just praying in the Holy Ghost. I'm taking authority over the spirits, okay? And when it came time to speak, Kathy was there. When it came time to speak, I took authority over all the spirits. The two priests could not talk. Okay, and, and seriously, she was there, and they could not speak. And so the doctor gets up and goes over to them, and they say, we can't talk. We have no voice. There's nothing, it's, and he's making these here similar. And so he says, well, Pastor Rick, you go and do the service. And it was 100% Hindus that were in there. I don't have no notes. I don't have no phone. I don't have nothing. And so anyway, I just, Holy Ghost, this is you and me. This is, this is one of those moments. And so I opened up my mouth, and it just started coming out. Well, at the end, everyone, and the place is packed, okay? Every one of the Hindus ended up giving their lives to Jesus that day. Right in there that day. Now, I say all that. If we didn't have a relationship with that guy first, it would have never been even an invite to come in over there. You know, the scriptures, and this is what I really like, is the word of God. It says in Romans 12, 14 in the, in the message, bless your enemies, no cursing under your breath. I shared about that this morning. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy and share tears with them when they're down. It said, get along with each other and don't be stuck up. Make friends with the nobodies and don't be the great somebody. What, who are the nobodies, if you want to term it that the scripture speaks about. Well, if you look in the Bible, the Zacchaeus was one of those despised, looked down tax collectors that all the religious people got bent out of shape because Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come on down from the tree. This day I'm coming into your house. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in their mind, he was one of the nobodies, okay, that Jesus saw as a somebody. How about Job's wife? Come on. How many know Job's wife is known for one statement in the Bible, and it's why don't you just curse God and die? That's all she's known about. We don't know her name. We don't know the town she was born in. We don't know her mom. We don't know her ancestral line. We don't know anything about her, but we do know that her, the one verse that she's known for is why don't you just curse God and die? And yet she became one of the greatest heroes in the Bible. You want to learn about restoration, just study the life of Job's wife, but I preach it at Pastor Mike's church. It's probably one of the, it needs to go in a book. It's such a good message, amen? And it shares about the process of restoration from Job's wife. Well, I'm not going to preach that tonight, but how about the woman at the well, married and divorced five times, living common law when Jesus finds her? Becomes the first evangelist, if you want to term it, over in Samaria. You know what's amazing is that 91% at the Billy Graham organization they said that 91% of Christians never share their faith in their entire life. That means 9 out of 10 believers never share their testimony, never share their faith. 9 out of 10. Well, if 10% is doing what we've done, what could we do with 50%? What could we do with 100%? You know, I was at a funeral. I, was, I don't do them anymore. But I've been asked at different times to do it. And I have this Iraqi family that are very close. I shared about the prayer meeting that went on in the church. And so uh, this doctor, he's a geologist guy. Uh, he actually passes away. And he was one of my greatest encouragers. At the end of every service, he would stay in the church till he got a hug from me. Okay? I'd walk out the back door so he'd always be sitting towards the back. 
and he waited to get a hug from me, him and his wife. And, and so anyway, they were all Iraqi Christians, and God has done an incredible work in him. And so his best friend in, at, the, at the university was a Muslim, okay? And all of their family came to the funeral. As a matter of fact, two-thirds of the ones that were at the funeral were all Muslims, and they asked me to do the funeral. So at the funeral, this guy comes up to me after I got done, and he says, you did something today to my heart. My heart is hard. You did something to my heart. I need to talk to you, okay? He says, come to my restaurant. I own the Paramount Restaurant, and I want you to come for dinner. Okay, he says, are you married? I said, well, listen, I, 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 I'll get together with you. I will. And, and God took me at, his, at the word. His name is Hussein. He says to call him Sam, so I call him Sammy because I said that was my dad's name. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, I've been over there now. I think it's three times that I had visited with him, and I've done undone now all of their his belief system on all the things that he doesn't believe why that Christ was God in the flesh, why he didn't believe that he rose from the dead. It's all undone now. And this guy's just like totally exposed. He says, he says, can I, can I come to church this weekend? Are you going to be there? I said, no, I'm on the road this week. He said, well, when are you going to be there? I want to come to church. This is Muslim families. Come on now. His mother-in-law is there. She's at the table. His wife is there, Samaya. And now Samaya just had a baby, okay? So I've been texting Sam about the baby and this and that just, just before I had left. And so he had the baby. They're all excited about it. We want you to come and bless the baby. Okay. How many are out there that all we look down and say is, why are they here? What are they doing? God says, make friends with the nobodies and don't try to be the great somebody. Listen to what this here script. Oh, I love this here one. This is another one here from the word of God. Let's see if I can find that. Is this good? Amen. Okay, here it is. This is all of it. Take a good look, friends. This is in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 in the message. Take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got, God called you in this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best among you. Not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses chose those nobodies to expose the hollow pretenses of the somebody. That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by by blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking, right living, a clean slate and a fresh start comes from God by the way of Jesus Christ. And that's why we have the saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God. So how many could say, how many could say we're going to make friends with the nobodies? Everybody stand up for a moment, okay? These are just a few of the nobodies in the word of God. Zacchaeus, the woman at the well, married and divorced five times. The woman caught in adultery. Onesimus, who was a slave. Phoebe, who was a Sakura. I looked it up. She was actually the first female deacon in the church, okay? John Mark, a mama's boy. Epaphras, listen very carefully. Naaman, the servant girl. David, he, he may have been conceived out of wedlock. Why? Because when Sammy came in, the prophet, he wasn't even invited to be in the town. And if you look at that, I was created in sin, the whole thing. I'm not going to preach that whole mess. I've been working on that for quite some time. But I believe that he was probably uh, born out of, a, uh, uh, of, 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 if you want to call it, conception from another woman or something. Anyway, we'll leave that for another time. All right? And then uh, listen over here. Mephibosheth, a cripple, a reject, fearful son of, Sam, uh, of, of Jonathan. So all of these individuals, listen here, were what we would call the nobodies. Now go ahead and sit down for a moment, okay? So let me just bring this here. Some of the nobodies that I have seen by the grace of God, God made a somebody. Uh, one of them's name is Rob and Stacy Quinlan. He was going to burn my church down because his mother got saved. Literally was coming with his friends to burn the church down because his mother got saved and kicked him out because he was drug dealing at the time. Okay, I won't go into Stacy. okay? Fiona, a $1,500 a day crack addict, she gets saved in the hole of a Calvary, a Calgary, Alberta penitentiary, a former heavy drug addict and user, and then Kathy puts her over in the women's home when she was over there. And then she gets married, listen to this here, to a fourth-generation Christian family guy in the church. 
And the Christian family gets all bent out of shape. So Kathy and I had to go and meet on a, on a few little meetings in there. Are you all there? And then, then how about this here one? My good friend Howie, he came home from school as a young boy and found his dad had just shot his mother, uh, uh, shot his mother's head off, okay? And then took the gun and blew his head off in front of his son. Okay. Took the whole side of his head right off, ended up still living from even that there, ended up in the penitentiary, and somehow he was sharing his story and one of the caregivers that was working with his dad in the penitentiary before she had died was in the church and actually was the one that had led his dad to the Lord before he died. And how about this here one over here? A young boy, uh, he, he's five years old and he's in his seat in the car and his little brother's in the baby seat next to him and his dad's in a rage and he comes and he beats and kills his baby brother in front of his brother. And that's Pastor Bob Powell today, who is over in Alliston pastoring a church. Can you say amen? amen? How about this here when this guy named Rick, when his mother found out that she was pregnant, he didn't want the child, and then he went into, she went into a major depression, lived an introverted, rejected life, and last night became a doctor of divinity. <laughs> God's got a sense here. How about a young woman... Uh, whose mom was divorced and remarried five times, left home at 14 years of age, was a hippie in downtown Toronto, a widow after her husband had died years later at 35, was killed in a car accident, who is now the most amazing wife, mother and grandmother, and she's right up here with me right now, Kathy. So uh, <laughs> God's a master at taking the nobodies and making, listen, and making them the great somebodies. Come on. Everybody, listen. You know, sometimes we look and we think that God can never use me because of my past and the mistakes that I made. Well, how many know Noah was a drunk? Come on, guys. Moses was such a hot, Moses was a hot-headed murderer. Come on. Abraham was too old, caused all the problems in the Middle East. Isaac, <laughs> listen, he, 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 Isaac was the first... Uh, the first registered ADD. He, he was a daydreamer. Come on. Jacob was a scoundrel, a liar and a deceiver. Lee had cow eyes and wasn't probably the prettiest girl of the day. How would you like your husband to get ready to take you to bed on your marriage night? He pulls the veil back and finds out it's not the one that he thought it was going to be. And he screams. Come on. <laughs> that must have been a pretty rough night. Uh, anyway, Joseph was abused and sold into slavery. And then he has on his rap sheet a uh, sex offender. And then David hired a hitman on Uriah, took his wife an affair, had serious <laughs> family issues, acted like a crazy man with the Philistines, ran away, left his throne to his son Absalom, then caused his whole army to enter into depression. And God says, he's a man after my own heart. <laughs> Paul who was concerned, was uh, concerned to Stephen's murder and abused the earliest of Christian. Deborah was a female judge in a male-dominated society. Gideon was a coward. Samson had a sex addiction. Raham was in the escort services. Rah uh, uh, Elijah, the great prophet, gets a letter from Jesse and then backs down and wants to just die in depression. Job lost his children tragically as well. In his whole livelihood, James and John were Jews with the Sicilian heritage. And they, they literally said this to Jesus. Jesus, why don't you just call fire down and burn them up? And it's like, I know that kind of talk. I know what goes on there with the Sicilian. Mary Magdalene had so many devils inside of her. Okay, nobody knows what it is. The little boy who had the five loaves of bread and two fishes, we still don't know what his name is, okay? The Samaritan woman had slept with so many women that when Jesus came and addressed it and read her mail, she comes back and with she men, said... so many men. Though. So many men she had been with. <laughs> and she comes back and said, listen, not one woman came out to hear Jesus... But it said all the men of the city came out to hear. Because why? Here's a man that told me everything I ever did. And the guys are sweating bullets. And man, did she talk about me? Was I, was I one? And, and so we look at all these nobodies. 
And they're in the Bible today to say, don't ever feel that you're disqualified. Don't ever feel that God's done with you. And don't ever look down on anyone and see him as a write-off. Because what you might think is a write-off could be the next Paul. Could be the next, uh, the, c- c- come on now. Could be the next deliverer. Could be the next Moses. Could be the next Sarah. Could be the next one that's out there in there. So don't ever disdain and look down on the nobodies because they could be the great somebody. Amen. (laughs) We're going to go to the next point, and that is Jesus was relevant. And, you know, one of the biggest things I think sometimes in the church is that we pick up our own language. You know, if you ever get around somebody that is an expert in, say, computers, how many know there's a computer language? And sometimes if you don't know that language, you don't understand it. And as, as Christians, we have our own language that we talk about in church, and we call it Christian ease. And we have to be careful when we're around non-believers that we don't try to get them to understand us at our level, but we go to their level. And we talk in their language. And that's a big issue with a lot of the church because people get out there and they're saying things and it just turns people off because they don't have a clue what you're talking about or they don't get it. And so one of the things that Jesus did is he told stories that people could relate to. He told stories about farming. You know, he told stories about laborers. You know, he told all kinds of stories that, you know, they could just understand. You know, he talked about the lost sheep. He talked about bearing fruit. He talked about things that the people in his day could connect with. And storytelling is really important. You know, when we're talking with people, Telling things that they can write. For example, if you're sharing your faith, or if you want to share your faith with somebody that loves sports, you can share faith in sports language. You can relate it to sports, right, very easily. So find out what people like, what they're into, and then preach the gospel in that language, relating it to what they are interested in because you can you can you can take anything and turn it into a message you can take anything and relate it to the word of god and 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 that's what we make that mistake sometimes where we're trying to get people you know we we talked about uh sometimes you know we we travel and go into a lot of churches and we were talking about this this afternoon like sometimes we go into a church and the preacher is preaching a message that's over everybody's head they don't have a clue what he's talking about because they're not, you know, into the Bible to the same level and depth. Now, I believe we teach, you know, depth in the, of the Bible, but we do it in a way that people can understand it. And we bring it to the level that anyone can understand because you don't know the education of everybody. And so when you're developing relationships in, in your life, find out what they like, find out their interests, and relate the gospel in that way. It's not hard to do. And, and it makes a big difference. So, and being relevant, sometimes we think, okay, to be relevant in the church means that we got to act like the world. No, we don't have to act like the world. But, you know, sometimes I, we go out and, you know, you might go outside and you'll see somebody that is um, maybe like a Mennonite person or, and they're wearing dresses down to their ankles and, and they don't wear makeup and all of that. And that, people have trouble connecting with that. People, the sinners have trouble connecting with that. You know, you want to look normal. Not worldly, like not, you know, dressing immodestly and all of that. But you want you can dress very modestly but still be rele- relevant. And so you want to look in a way that people will... And I'm not saying you all have to look like really cool or hip. I'm just saying that you have to look normal, sure. you know. <laughs> Whatever that is anymore. But, <laughs> you know... I can shave my hair. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> We're not going to go there. Um, but, but just, you know... Present yourself in a way that is, uh, you know, I mean, there can be exceptions to that. I remember we went down to, uh, was it Nicaragua, not Nicaragua, or um, no, Dominican Republic. We were down there. There's this one guy in our church. He comes and goes. He's not really regular, but he's very eccentric. He looks crazy. Like, he dresses really crazy. And um, he ended up coming on this mission trip. And we were thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, he's going to just turn it. But on a mission trip, he was actually an attraction. And so what happened, he looked so crazy, people would come out to look at him, and then we'd be able to preach. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, he would preach too. But, um, but, I'm, but all I'm saying is, you don't want to act, talk in a way, and look at a way that's a turnoff. 
You know, that's what I'm saying. And so, you know, I always like to, when I come into a church, and I always say this, when I go into church, I think, what would, if somebody came in off the street, what would they think of this place? What would they think of what they see, you know, what they hear, what they feel? You know, would they feel love? Would they feel like these people are just normal people, but they have something I don't have? You know, I remember when I got saved, I was invited to a Bible study, and um, I didn't want to go to the Bible study. I only went because I liked the guy that invited me, and this is back in my teen years. And um, I went to the Bible study, and I remember thinking, like, what kind of people would want to sit around and read a Bible? You know, like, that sounds so boring. And, uh, but when I went there, I got to know the people and realize these are real people. These people have been through stuff in their lives, and, and the love they showed me was what kept me coming. That's what kept me coming. And they didn't act weird. You know, they were just normal people, and they didn't, you know, talk over my head. They didn't, you know, act in any weird way, but they just showed me the love of God, and they, they told me their testimonies, and they were very natural and very real. And God wants us just to be, our, be natural, you know, don't try to be a super spiritual person that, you know, sometimes we try to talk so spiritual that people don't understand what we're talking about. And, and, and Jesus was relevant, and he was real, and he was practical, and he told people. But he was also, because he was in tune with God, and he kept his relationship with, in prayer with God, he was able to see into people's hearts, and he was able to speak into their heart. In other words, he would know. If there was something like like the woman at the well, you know, he right knew, right he knew, you know, what her situation was, and he was able to say it. And because he said it, that spoke to her, you know, that really, really hit her. And so sometimes we need to just pray and say, God, you know, show me something about this person that you know and that I can speak into and help that person. Because we have the Holy Spirit. And, and the Holy Spirit will reveal to us what's going on in people's lives sometimes. And all we have to do is say, you know what? You're, God just showed me that you're really hurting and that you, you know, you're struggling with whatever, whatever God shows you. And, um, and that will really draw people. Because people want to hear from God. People want to know that God cares. And that he knows them. So we need to be relevant. And we need to, to look at, at what, what it is, you know, about people that God knows that he wants to do in them, that he wants to show them. But relate to them on their level. When you have a little child, you don't talk to them like you would an adult. I mean, how many look at a baby and you're going, oh, goo, 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 you know, you're talking, we all act weird when we see a baby, right? Why do we act like that? connect with the kid. On yeah, because we're trying to connect with them on their level, right? And we're trying to get their attention. And so, but we act stupid doing that because we act like a baby when, we, when we're talking to a baby. And, um, and so, you know, whatever, when you're talking to a child, you teach children on their level. We, you teach what they can relate to, what they can understand. And that's what being relevant is. And so when we're out there, when we're talking to people, find out what is it they're interested in, you know, and then relate it to them. Uh, relate it to maybe a movie that's out there that they, that, you know, they liked. And you can find things in anything where you can bring it into the gospel and relate it to the word of God. And that's what Jesus did. That's how he spoke to people. He didn't get up there and, you know, said, thus saith the Lord, and, you know, go on and on saying all these things. No, he talked to them in stories. And that was the, that was the language. That they didn't have TVs. They didn't have movies. They didn't have all that. But they had stories. They told stories. And that's what he did. He used the way of communication. Now we have things like the internet. We have Facebook. And we have all kinds of things that we can use. Because they're the means of communication we have. But we need to do it in a, in a way people can relate to and connect to. And never sell the gospel out in the name of relevancy that you don't use the Bible or don't quote scripture or don't minister the word of God. I've seen it go to the other extreme now. In a lot of camps, they want to be so socially accepted in the culture that they actually are leaving the word of God out. And all they're doing is teaching stories. I'm all for the stories, but let's have the scripture as the basis yes. and the foundation for the story. Let's talk about his story. Come on now. And, and so in relevancy does not mean that we're diminishing or putting any de-emphasis on the scripture. It's the scripture that's going to set them free. It's the scripture, listen very carefully, that's going to break the chains in their minds. It's the scripture that we're not never to be ashamed of that the apostle Paul spoke about. So if we're going to get the job done, 
We're going to need to be authentic and genuine, but we're also going to need to be very, very relevant. Very relevant. Come on. I dress this way because I kind of I like this kind of dress. This is how I am. But there's many places I go to that you have to wear a suit and tie. Okay? That's where they're at. I'll just share a good, really good story. I was brought in uh, just over two and a half years ago down to a Bible school down in Charleston, Maine. And it's an incredible school, and it's been known that bring many Canadian students in from the Maritimes, New Brunswick, because it's real close to the border there. And when I went in, the, the, the head guy actually took me out afterwards, and he said, what you think of the school? And I says, well, do you want me to be very honest with you? And he says, yes, I do, Rick. He says, I brought you in for that. I said, sir, I says, this thing needs a, a total makeover. I says, it's just... It's too old school. It's too old fashioned. The girls got these dresses down to their ankles there. I said, the worship was too quiet in there. You need a lead guitar. You need some other things in there. And, and, and I said, sir, you're wearing a three piece suit and tie. And he said, well, that's what all the, the I said, that's the problem. That's why many are coming. I couldn't recommend the, the people to come to the school. Okay. So anyway, he recognized that his time, okay, in leading, it was time for him to step aside and to put a next generation guy in after the conversation. So they invited me back two years later, and I come back to the school, and all the changes that I mentioned about relevancy, all the changes, they made 100% of the changes, and now the school is just breaking out. We went into the worship service, it was just like your church tonight. Amen. Everything was electrified. Everything was moving. The whole thing. And, and, and this, this doctor comes up to me and he says, he says, Rick, look at it. And he had a, uh, he didn't have a, uh, he had a sport coat on in an open shirt with no tie, no vest or anything else. And he says, it's worked over here now. We're connecting <laughs> with him now. Amen. And so I got the biggest kick out of that now. And, but you know what? We don't realize sometimes how irrelevant we are. And here's the thing that I want to share, too. Whatever subject it is in the Bible that we're talking about, it needs to brought in, be brought into an applicable way that the individuals can respond to the message. If we're just filling their heads with knowledge and they're not able to take the knowledge and apply it on an everyday level, then it's just not going to work. It's not going to produce. Jesus wasn't there giving messages to give them knowledge on things. He was there giving a message to bring transformation to their homes, to their lives, to their, to their future. Can you say amen? And that's how the word of God needs to be brought out. The next subject is very, very... Is anybody getting anything out of this? See, Hodges, again, this is what he lives. This is what he breathes. And if you listen to any of his podcasts or go online and listen, he's, he's doing exactly what he preached. This is what he lives by. This is... What he has recognized, these six words that he found in following the studying the word of God in the gospels and the life of Jesus has changed his whole philosophy of ministry in the past. And this is how he's doing church today. And it's working. Amen. Amen. So the third one, and I believe you guys are operating in this here, is the spirit of excellency. You know, there was something on Daniel. The Bible said he had an excellent spirit. Come on. Okay, and what happened? That excellent spirit brought him promotion. That excellent spirit brought him favor. And if you look at churches, you look at leaders that are doing things with a spirit of excellency, there's always going future. It's always excelling. Because what? The word excellent literally comes from the Hebrew root word where it means to excel, to push forward, to break out. Okay? So there's no limitations on an excellent spirit. And the good news is, is that same spirit that's on your life is the same spirit on my life. And Jesus' spirit is an excellent spirit. Amen? The enemy hates excellency, but God loves it and embraces it. You know, we could talk about excellency too, and I want to clarify, excellency does not mean perfection. Because you'll never have perfection. And sometimes we, some people, especially if you're a C personality, you'd like, you would want everything to be perfect and you get very critical and negative if it's not. You know what? It's never going to be perfect. The church will never be perfect. It never will. There's always going to be things that, but you want it to be your best. You know, you want to do your best. Excellency means you're doing your best. 
It may not be perfect, but it's your best. It means that you're faithful, you're diligent, you're committed, you're, you know, doing things to the best of your ability. And, and so we have to make, you know, discern the difference between excellence and perfection. And um, so, in other words, you, you only have what you have to work with. And, you know, when a church is growing and it's young, you don't have everything that a church maybe that's been around for 30, 40 years has. But you make the best of what you have and you use it to the best of your ability. And, and you don't slack off and you know we we go to a lot of churches and some of them you see they do things with excellence you walk in you see the the church is clean it doesn't have to have all the bells and whistles but it's, you can tell it's done right they're they're doing things on time you know it's clean the 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 um you know, just the way they do things. You just know what's done well. And and there's other churches we go in and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, like they're supposed to start at a certain time. They start 20 minutes late. You know, it's just chaotic and confusing. And you know what I mean? Like there's a difference in, in how things are done. And so, it do, but it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with the size of the church. It has nothing to do with the building. It, you know, you can have a shack and make it nice. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't matter. It just means that you're doing your best. And that's really what God expects for us, to put our best foot forward. Because, you know, we're, we're serving the King of Kings. You know, we're serving God. And, and we need to be the best we can for Him. And, and, and don't worry about being perfect. Just be your best. And don't look and compare yourself with somebody else, because they might be able to do things a little better because they have more gifting or, you know, they're in a better place. So God is looking for those to be your best. And I'm going to skip down to the next one now because of time. But the, the, Jesus was, uh, I believe Jesus was enjoyable to be around because sinners wouldn't have wanted to hang around with him if he wasn't. And, and so we need to be fun. We need to be able to have a good time without sinning. And you can have fun without sinning. And, you know, people think you can't, but you can. And I, you know, I have a woman's home, and so I have all these women that come through the, the home, and, and, you know, they're into drugs and alcohol and partying and all of that stuff, and then they get saved, and they, you know, they graduate from the home, and they come out, and then they realize, hey, I can have fun without getting drunk. You know, I can have fun without getting high. I remember one time we uh, had a bunch of them over at our house, and at that time we had a house with a pool in the yard, and, and so I was having a pool party with them, and they were all sitting around, and they, we were having a great time. We were laughing, and I, I remember a couple of the girls commented, I've never had this kind of fun unless I was drunk or, you know, high or whatever. I didn't know you could, you know. And so these are things we, we need to be able to have fun with people. We need to be able to enjoy people and be able to, you know, just enjoy life and, and be fun to be around. You don't have to tell dirty jokes. You don't have to, you know, do things that are wrong to have fun. You can have a lot of fun and play a lot of games. You can do all kinds of things with people because people want to, hang out with you if you're going to have we have a few people that we invite over to our house that aren't saved and we play games with them and we just have a good time and we we laugh and you know we we just enjoy them and they enjoy us and we're not trying to cram the gospel down their throats we know they're going to get saved in god's time and we're just gonna and they will say things to us like uh we love coming over here we like being around you you know we feel really good when we're here well, that's what you want to hear, right? That's, that's the way we should be. And, um, but there's no alcohol. There's no drugs. There's no, you know, nothing that we would be ashamed of. But we're having a good time. And so we need to be fun. We need to be enjoyable to be around. And we need to have that right attitude and have the joy of the Lord. In fact, I remember the thing that got me saved was, was exactly that. I remember the Bible study that I was going to. The people there were so happy, and they were fun. And I remember finally, after going to the Bible study after a few weeks, I said to them, like, well, what is it you have that I don't? Because I was doing the Bible study with them out of my own old catechism teaching that I had as a kid, not understanding, you know, that there was a, a step I had to take. And um, so I, you know, I thought I was one of them. But then I, as I got into this Bible study, I realized I'm missing something here. I'm missing something. They have something that I don't have. And whatever it is, I want it. And that's when they told me, you need to invite Jesus into your heart. And when you do that, then you'll have what we have. And so I did that, and I had what they had, you know. And, and so God opened up my eyes, and I was able to see. And I experienced the, the Spirit of God in my life. And he totally changed my life, and I never looked back. But we, the, we have to be able to have that 
in us, showing that in us, which we're, we got to be fun to be around. If we're just sitting there like a bunch of prudes and we don't enjoy anything in life, you know, they're going to, well, who wants what you got, right? We, we want to be able to show people that we can have a good life and a fun life and, and serve God. You know, and it's great because we don't have the hangovers and we don't have, you know, all of the negative stuff that comes. You know, we can get drunk in the spirit and not have a hangover. <laughs> we, we can have a good time with God and enjoy life and, and not, you know, end up uh, regretting what we did. Right. And that's people. See, people do drugs and they and they do alcohol. I've learned this because they're hurting. They're just trying to mask their pain. And, and, and so that's the only thing they know how to do it. They don't know that there's a better way. But once they find out that way, it works, right? And it changes them. And I believe this is very important. Everything we do needs to be life-giving. Come on. Where there's life, people are going to be laughing. There's going to be an enjoyable. And it's not wrong to tell a joke once in a while. I'm not the best joke teller, but there was an abbot one time that had this monk came into the monastery and when the monk came into the monastery, the abbot goes to him and he says, listen, you're allowed to say one, one sentence or one word at the end or two words at the end of one year of in the service in the monastery. He said, you come before me. So the first year comes up and, and the abbot says, what's the, what do you have to say? He said, cold food. Okay, so that's it. Comes back a year later before the abbot and he says, what do you have to say? He said, hard bed. Okay, Abbott says, okay, comes back the third year, and he says, I quit. <laughs> and he says, doesn't surprise me. All you've done since you've been here is complain. <laughs> okay. So there's things that you can do to lighten up the crowd. Here's what's important, too, is you always need to know who the crowd is that you're ministering to, okay, the people that are there. And uh, what I've learned is that we're just going to try to be ourselves, just be real, just have some fun and enjoy life. Amen? People want to be around people that are enjoying life some. All right? And the scripture says this, a merry heart, it what? Doeth good like a medicine. So it's like taking medicine to your soulish nature. And then Proverbs 15, 13 says, a glad heart makes a happy face. A broken heart crushes the spirit. Romans speaks of this here. And then in 1 Peter 3, if you want to enjoy life, is there anybody who wants to enjoy life? Everybody stand up for just a minute and look at this here. Look what it says. If uh, there's 1,522 ifs, which means on condition that, on supposition that, if you want to, what does it say? Come on. Enjoy life and see what? Many happy days. What are you going to do? Keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Guess what? You're going to enjoy life that way. And God wants us to enjoy him he wants you to laugh a little bit. You know what I've learned about in studying laughter out? You can be seated. Studying laughter out is all the health benefits that it actually has for your arteries, that it actually has for diabetes. So many health benefits. We can read them. Uh, you, you can just type it in online and see the health benefits of laughter, and it'll blow you away. So what's the experience when people come to church? Is there a buzz in the house? You know, when I asked the leaders after we met together, Mike was there. I said, what did you think of it? And all I heard from all of them, there was a buzz in the house for the national. Yeah. That buzz means people are enjoying. They're connecting with one another. Do we leave an atmosphere where there's an atmosphere of rejoicing? Is there an atmosphere for miracles? Because the atmosphere is the surrounding influence that's going to permeate into the room and the connection point with the people. And everybody said amen. I'd like to go on that one for a long time. I, I've had some people, I'm just going to be very honest, that guy in the drum cage today made my night. Yeah. Okay, He was so passionate, so excited up there, and it's like, yeah, that's exactly, he's got it, he's loving it. I go out in the parking lot, there's ushers just making you feel like you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. And he even told me I could park in the handicap tonight. Did you get it? <laughs> I'm not uh, receiving that I'm handicapped. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you're anyway. Or not, you're walking okay. like that right now. Anyway, the next one is, in, well, you go ahead in the next one. Kathy. Well, the next one is uh, accepting of everyone. And 
Jesus, you know, he was never prejudiced. He didn't judge people based on how much money they had or what their education was or who they were or who they weren't. Jesus loved everybody. And, you know, sometimes we can be that way. I've heard stories about, I remember one time hearing a story about a pastor that dressed like a street bum. And he was, he was, a, he was actually an evangelist. And he was speaking at different churches. And he would go to the churches and he would dress like he was a street bum and sit outside the church and and people you know he'd try and talk to people and people would just kind of brush him off and you know not have anything to do with him and then he'd go in and get up and he'd be the preacher and uh, the guest speaker and so it just showed how you know and he would comment about that say you know what I was here and you thought I was this and you wouldn't ha- give me the time of day but now that you realize that I am the evangelist, you know, you want to talk to me. And how many of us are like that, where we just brush off people and judge them rather than, you know, care about everyone? And and that goes for age. You know, I'm really big right now on, um, probably because of our age, um, There there is a syndrome called ageism. And I think we talked about that the last time we were here, about how, yeah, we, we need to go to the next gen, we need to pass the baton on, we need to do that. But those next gen, they have to value the older generation and not write them off and think, well, they're no longer valid or any good. And so we can do that, whether it's age, whether it's people's sex, whether it's their race, whether it's, you know, whatever. There's all different reasons why we judge and categorize people. And we, and we all have certain people in our hearts, if we're honest, that we don't like. And sometimes those are the very people that God will want you to reach out to. I remember a testimony I had many years ago where uh, I was going to a church. This is before I was in ministry. And I was going to a church, and, and I, it was a very small church. And I was a new Christian. I was in my, early, my late teens, and, and I was praying to God for a friend. And I, because there was nobody I could relate to or connect with in the church. And so um, I kept saying, God, send me a friend. Well, one day, God points to this woman, points this woman out to me in the church who had just come that day and said, I want you to be her friend. Well, she was not the type of person I would want to hang around with at all. Like, (laughs) totally not at all. But God just convicted me and said, be her friend. Well, I invited her out after church, and it turned out she wasn't even saved, but she was a totally, I want to say this in a nice way, um, a person that would just turn you off. And the way she acted, the way she talked, everything about her was, she just wasn't a very nice person. And really negative attitude and, and just, you know, just not a nice person. And God kept saying, I want you to love her. I want you to, you know, I want you to be her friend. And everything in my flesh didn't want to. But I did it anyway because God told me. And she ended up getting saved and ended up over time becoming a a friend of our family. She was actually a nanny for my kids for a number of years. And it, it was interesting what ended up happening out of that whole thing. But, you know, she was so full of rejection. And so some people, they're just so hurt. And they, they send that kind of, they act in a way that causes people to reject them. And and you have to put boundaries down sometimes with people like that because sometimes the first person that shows them any kind of interest, they latch onto. But So you have to have boundaries. But at the same time, don't just push them totally away. Just put up the boundaries and, and still be their friend. But look for that person that maybe is the outsider or the rejected person. And make sure when people come into your church, right, regardless of who they are, what race they are, you know, how well-dressed they are. Jesus even talked about how, oh, yeah, the well-dressed people, you tell them to sit here and the others, you send them back here. No, don't do that. Jesus wouldn't do that. And, and so we need to be accepting of every, every person that walks through our doors should feel welcome. Unless there's somebody that, that is there for, there's a few people we've kicked out of our church. And that's because their reason for being there was to prey on other people. And those are the people, obviously, you don't want. But other than that, you know, that they had wrong motives. But it had nothing to do with anything other than their, they had evil intent in their hearts. But, um, you know, when people come through those doors, it doesn't matter if they're simple. It doesn't matter what what it is about them, you need to show them love and acceptance. And that's what Jesus would do. And I've learned this. The more we reach out to the down and outers, because with the woman's home, we're reaching out to prostitutes. We're reaching out to strippers. We're reaching out to people that are coming out of jail. And the more we reach out to those people, the more God's brought into our church doctors, psychologists, you know, different people that are well-educated, because those people are drawn to places where they can help the down and outer. 
And God will bring in people sure. that have, you know, lots of good resources and education and things. When you start helping the people he cares about, he'll bring in the other people. But if you're just going after the rich people or the people that seem to have it all together, then you're not going to grow. You've got to reach out to those that need help. What I've learned about this is God, when I say inherently, inherently means that it's God given, something that He put inside. And psychologists now, in the study of psychology in 101, they've actually assessed now that there are four basic human needs that's inside of every person, which tells us this is something that God has imparted inside. And the number one human need that mankind has is to belong and to be accepted. Number two is to grow and be healthy. Number three is to share what it is that they have and care for people. And number four is to succeed and reduplicate our life. When we tap into those four areas of the human need, we'll be able to accept people wherever they're at. Let me just state this last thing is that, and I think I taught this when I did on honor here at your church, there's people that are by nature task oriented. I have a daughter that is task oriented. okay? Melissa that ran Open Bible for many years. And there's other people that are people oriented. What does that mean? They just like to have fun on the job. They can get the job done, but they're very fun loving. They're, and they seem like they're all over the map wherever they're at, okay? How many know that, that honor will help you relate to both of them and to use them both, but one cannot look down on the other because they don't do things the same way that they do. That brings, I remember in the office, we had a, a woman in there, and she was one of the social butterflies, and the other two girls were very task-oriented. They didn't want the one in the office, okay, because she was, she was fun to be around. She was a, a riot to be around. That was our Linda, Kathy. And to make a long story short, we pulled Linda out of the office and brought her in with some of the other employees that are fun-loving, and they get the job done, and they have more fun and everything else. How many know you need them both in the church? Last area, and this is so huge, especially in our culture today, because it seems uh, in our travels, Kathy and I, that many people are shunning away from the power of God. Let me tell you something right now. This world, we can have the best of message. We can be authentic. We can be relevant. We can do things with excellency. We can be the funnest people around. We can be accepting of all. But if we're not manifesting and demonstrating the power of God, we will never make biblical disciples of the people that we are there. The Bible says the works that you do, that I do, Jesus said, shall you do in greater works because I go to the Father. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could expect, think, or ask, according to the power that worketh inside of us. If we're not teaching the people that the power of God is resident in you, you're a miracle happening, you're a miracle in the making, it's inside of you, you're a powerhouse for God, then we're failing to teach the whole counsel of the Word of God. Amen? The generation that is here today is hungry for the supernatural, is hungry for a visitation, is hungry to see miracles, and is hungry to see the anointing that is on the inside of them. It's our job to instruct them, to teach on it, and to keep it before them constantly so it doesn't fall by the wayside. Amen? Amen. Kathy, you want to? Well, I think, too, the power of God has to be in line with even all the things we just talked about. So in other words, you know, I, I believe God when I'm with people and I pray for people that God will give me insight, that he'll give me a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. You know, he'll give me something that I can pass on to that individual or, you know, having the gifts in the church, but having them done right, not out of control, not out of order, not, you know, where they're all weird, but things have to be done decently in order. But, but the, the point is people are looking for the supernatural. I mean, most of these movies you see nowadays are all about supernatural, right? And, um, and they're about the supernatural because there's something inherent in every one of us for the supernatural because God put that in us because we are more than what we are in the natural. And so we have to tap into that more of what we are and be and allow God to speak through us in ways that and and use us to pray for people, to believe God for for people, to believe God for miracles, to have the word, prophetic words and, and things over people at the right time when God wants that to happen. And uh, but we do it by praying for people. I find when I pray for individuals, God, that's when God will give me something. But I got to be praying. 
Right. If I'm not praying, I'm not going to get it. And so prayer will help stir up the gifts. Prayer will help you get the supernatural activated in your lives. And and like I said earlier, when you're meeting people, you know, you want to meet them where they're at. Or you want to maybe speak a word into them from God. And that's the kind of thing people are looking for. That's why people go to fortune tellers and, you know, all these things. They do all these things. They read horoscopes because they're, sure. they're trying to find yeah. answers. They're trying to find answers. But when you have the power of God working in you and you give people just be careful with words from God that you don't use them to control and manipulate people. Yeah. You know, there's there's balance in everything we do. And so we have power. We have the ability to, and I've seen people use the gifts to control people, and that's not right either. So just be genuine and real and be authentic. Be, you know, love people, care about people, not, don't, don't do it for yourself, but do it for them. And that's what's really important. We need to, what's our motive? Why are we doing this? You know, we need to ask ourselves, what's my motive here? Am I trying to prove something or be something? You know, or am I caring about an individual? And I want them to be free. And I want them to know God. Amen? I believe there's a spirit of faith in the house. I believe there's a spirit of joy in the house. I believe there's a spirit of peace in the house. And I believe that when we lay hands, there's going to be something that's going to go into you tonight that's going to make a difference, that's going to stir the gift of God up on the inside. Amen? Thank you for listening. We hope that you enjoyed our message. If you are in the Quinty West area, we would love to have you visit us on Sunday morning at 24 Dundas Street West, Trenton, Ontario. Check out our service times on our website at atthecrossroads.ca.